In my last video, we explored the story of Morgoth, the Omen King of Lindell. But to get the full picture of the regal Omen, there is another we have to learn about, one who represents the other path that Morgoth could have taken. Instead of defending the Erd Tree and renouncing his blood, Morgoth could have festered, given himself to his blood's curse, and swore revenge on an unjust world. At the end of this path of darkness is the key to fully understand Morgoth. It is another omen born of the same circumstances. It is his twin, Moog, Lord of Blood. But I'm not going to talk about Moog right now, because he deserves a whole nother video. Instead, I want to look at a core aspect important to the stories of both Morgoth and Moog. I want to look at the Curse of the Omen, where it comes from, and what it can tell us about the lands between. I spoke a bit about the Omen in my last video, how they are born outside of grace and are subsequently enslaved. The common Omen have their horns cut off and are used as soldiers in the Order's armies. The Royal Omen are allowed to keep their horns, but they are sequestered into the sewers of the Royal Capital. The two Omen demigods, Morgoth and Moog, were both originally locked away, as we read from their shackles but they broke free and followed different paths. So far, we don't know what specifically causes an omen to be born, other than by some sort of spurning by the Greater Will or Erdry, but it seems any parents can give birth to omen, since even the parents of the demigod twins were able to have a non-omen child too. Queen Merica and Godfrey, first Elden Lord, had omen twins, but also a non-omen in Godwin. The Omen are a seeming mystery, but we can learn more about them if we investigate the Crucible. The Crucible is an elusive entity in Elden Ring. Many, if not most, players probably won't be able to say anything certain about it after a playthrough. But there are a few hints and descriptions throughout the world that pull back the curtain. The first and most relevant to our Omen discussion is the set of Crucible Talismans, a group of three talismans that each bear the name of the Crucible along with an attribute, not Feather and Scale. Each of these are found in an environment relating to the omen, whether that be dropped by an omen killer, located in the omen sewers, or guarded by an actual omen. They respectively read, a talisman fashioned from a bony knot, scale, or feathers that embodies the aspects of various creatures, said to have grown on the human body long ago. A vestige of the crucible of primordial life. Born partially of devolution, it was considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times but is now increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. So it sounds like the Crucible is some entity of life that existed long ago, before the current age. And its vestiges were viewed as divine, but are now seen as impure. We find a similar description of the Crucible that goes into more detail in the Aspects of the Crucible incantations, which read, This is a manifestation of the Erd Tree's primal vital energies an aspect of the primordial crucible, where all life was once blended together. The crucible here sounds like a previous version or stage of the world and life. Life used to be in one contiguous blend. If you've watched my ending videos, you might pick up that this sounds fairly similar to the Three Fingers description of the One Great, an entity that all life existed in before divisions or individuals. This is what we achieve in the Lord of Frenzied Flame ending melting everything back into one with the Chaos Flame. So, the Crucible could be something like the One Great, a time when all life was in one big hodgepodge, without individual beings or lives and souls. It could even be the One Great. But before committing to that, we have one more description to look at. The Crucible incantations are wielded by Crucible Knights. Their armor tells another aspect of the story. Reading, Armor of the Crucible Knights, who served Godfrey, the first Elden Lord holds the power of the Crucible of Life, the primordial form of the Erdry. This doesn't necessarily contradict anything said so far, but it tells us that whatever the Crucible was, it served as the base or original form of the Erdry. Perhaps the Crucible transformed into the Erdry over time due to the influence of the Greater Will, and maybe the Elden Beast and or Elden Ring. This would work with the idea of the Frenzied Flame and Three Fingers blaming the Greater Will for ruining the One Great by introducing individuals and divisions. In any case, as the Crucible progressed over time, life seems to have become more individualized. If all life was once blended together, it now seems to not be. Even long ago in the ancient times referred to by the Crucible Talismans, there was individual life, because that life would somehow devolve and bear an aspect of the Crucible, and such a sign was considered a mark of divinity. We see another case of individuals interacting with the Crucible 
in The Misbegotten, the winged humanoids treated as slaves throughout the lands between. Their ashes read, The Misbegotten are held to be a punishment for making contact with the Crucible, and from birth they are treated as slaves, or worse. The Misbegotten were able to make some form of contact with the Crucible. Perhaps their wings and feathers are vestiges, as discussed by the Feathered Talisman. The history and progression of the Crucible seems to be a complex one, originally subsuming all of life, but then existing alongside life. It even somehow imparted its vestiges onto living individuals, with those individuals being seen as signs of divinity. With all this in mind, we can finally return to our omen and come to a slightly clearer understanding. It seems that all signs point to the omen bearing a mark or vestige of the Crucible. Remember that anyone can give birth to an omen, and the Crucible talismans state that their vestiges, which took the form of things like feathers, scales, and horns, body knots basically count as horns to me, are said to have grown on the human body long ago. So omens seem like humans born with the vestiges of the Crucible. Maybe something like this was the case with the Misbegotten and some other creatures too. We can also read the ashes of Perfumer Trisha, who was a healer who dedicated her efforts to treating misbegotten, omen, and all those seen as impure. The omen, misbegotten, and others are seen as impure, likely because of their connection with the Crucible. In an ancient time, the omen likely would have been regarded as divine, or at least bearing signs of divinity, but in the modern world of the lands between, they are enslaved and subjugated. We see conclusively that marks of the crucible are considered impure by the current world. Maybe as the greater will pushed the world away from the crucible's original state, it and its followers grew to have some animosity for the crucible and its influence. The modern order has treated the omen and others marked by the crucible as demons, using them for their strength but torturing and enslaving them otherwise. This treatment of the Crucible as impure finds an interesting inflection point in the Crucible Knights. These are knights that served Godfrey and practiced incantations of the Crucible. And a quick aside, each of the incantations and magic of the knights seem to correspond to the features of the talismans. The horns are like the omen, the fire breath is like the scaled lizards, wings for feathers, and so on. Perhaps the knights began their practice long ago, in a time before there was significant animosity towards the Crucible. But with Godfrey banished, they were also moved out of the way. The ones we come across in game are mostly pushed off to the side, whether they be in Everjails, at the bottom of graves, fighting with misbegottens, or full-blown heretics. The Crucible Knights, which were legendary knights of old, are not being utilized or honored by the Order. It seems plausible that their relationship with the Crucible is the reason. Now we can look once more at our omen with a renewed understanding. They serve as a prime example of the history of the lands between. In them, we can see traces of the past form of life, the Crucible, that which was to become the Erd Tree. In an ancient time, after the Crucible began its progression, perhaps at the behest of the Greater Will, the Omen and those like them who showed signs of the Crucible were regarded as divine, a sharp contrast to the state we see them in now, ostracized and imprisoned. Things likely only got worse with the shattering and the decay of the Order. Perhaps omen were not always blighted by so many horns or other growths. Maybe the Crucible's vestiges used to appear more like the forms we see Crucible Knights take with their incantations. Slightly more uniform growths that do not get in the way so much, like all the horns marring the eyes of the twins. Maybe there was a balance to be had between the Crucible's original state of life as one big soup and the complete subjugation of the Crucible by the Greater Will and the Order. I'm inclined to think so since both Moog and Morgoth, the Omen demigods, put up guards against the Tarnished getting to the Frenzied Flame. There is nothing in the game that shows Morgoth and Moog working together, except for this one instance, where Moog puts up an apparition and Morgoth puts a seal, both in an effort to prevent the player from the Frenzied Flame ending, where the world would maybe return to a Crucible-like state, melted into one. I think this is decent evidence that a complete return to the Crucible is not a desirable goal. And obviously the horrid treatment of the Omen Misbegotten and so many others by the Order is not ideal either. As I've been saying, a direction toward balance, more in tune with the Crucible and its vestiges, but not all the way to where life becomes unrecognizable, seems to be the best outcome for everyone. And we could get into a discussion about which ending best serves this purpose, but I'm pretty sure that would just start a few flame wars in the comments. Besides, I already made my stance on that clear in another video. 
The story of the Omen is a revealing one, for much of what is beneath the surface of the main story of Elden Ring. Their plate and placement gives us a good vantage to see into the past, understand the present, and maybe see what's best for the future. With this knowledge, we can have an even better understanding of Morgoth, and we're more ready to learn about Moog. There is of course more to discuss on this topic, I really think there is a tie-in to the Crucible and the Erd Tree with the Ancestral Spirit, but we can wait till a proper Moog discussion for that. After all, they're in the same underground zone. If you've enjoyed this exploration into Omen lore, consider subscribing to the channel. It lets me know that people are interested in the content and want to see more. Like I said, I'm looking to do Moog next, and plenty more individual demigods and other characters, but that might be in a bit since I'll be with family for the holidays. I tried to get this video out fast, so I hope you all feel the quality didn't dip too much. Also, I don't have a good idea why Morgoth's horn disappear when he dies. A lot of comments from my previous video were asking that question. It probably has something to do with his complicated relationship with the Erd Tree and being grace given, despite being an omen with vestiges of the Crucible. If I had to guess, it's some interplay of these conflicting forces that causes that unique circumstance that we see happen. With that, I hope you enjoyed watching, and feel free to leave a comment about your thoughts on the Omen and the Crucible, and whether or not you like these kinds of videos that delve more into the world of the Lands Between than a specific demigod. I'm going to do more of the demigods and characters, but if people enjoy these kinds of videos, I'm happy to do more lore like this, since it is interesting to get into the deep underpinnings of the story and the world, that really deep lore like the Crucible and the Start of Life, and kind of what I did in the Outer Gods video. So with that, thanks for spending time on this video. Bye.